The average Lyme person, by the time they're being diagnosed with chronic Lyme, has seen seven to 10 doctors. The number one priority we have for anyone suffering from Lyme is to restore proper immune system function. And the number two goal is to kill it. And I didn't mess up the order. Lyme is genetically unique. And technically, the Lyme that's in you has genetically adapted to you which makes it slightly different than the Lyme in anybody else. It's not just chronic Lyme, but sequelae, an immune system dysfunction secondary to Lyme. How do we differentiate between the two? There are other things ticks carry. I tell people Lyme disease is like Jennifer Aniston from Friends. She's just the most famous person from Friends. There were a lot of other people in Friends. <laughs> Anaplasma is the fourth most common tick-borne illness, and it does a couple things really you need to know as a doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast. I'm Dr. Emmy Brown here with the incomparable co-host Melissa Gentile. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Kyle Warren, chiropractor and certified functional medicine practitioner. His practice, Restorative Health Solutions in Adena, Minnesota, emphasizes personalized care utilizing detailed patient history and testing to create individualized treatment plans. From his own struggles with digestive issues and debilitating migraines to his wife's battle with undiagnosed Lyme disease, Dr. Warren's personal experiences have fueled his passion for holistic health solutions. His dedication to uncovering the underlying causes of chronic illness and his compassionate approach make him a beacon of hope for many. Tune in as we dive deep into a more holistic approach to Lyme with Dr. Kyle Warren. Dr. Warren, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's dive into your personal experience, if you don't mind. I'm wondering, sure. can you share what motivated you to seek alternative testing for Lyme after a negative test for your wife came back? Well, um, yeah. So my wife got sick around 2010 and despite a lot of resources as a, as a chiropractor doing functional medicine, I, we couldn't really figure out what was wrong, which is a very frustrating experience. And I was actually talking to a friend who practices in Pennsylvania. He said, oh, you do a lot of chronic fatigue, chronic pain, weird neurological problems, and you live in Minnesota. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. goes, so you must see a lot of Lyme disease. And I said, I don't I don't see any Lyme disease. And he goes, oh, so you miss a lot of Lyme disease. <laughs> oh, no. <That's> a good <laughs> and I was like, you're a jerk, Chris, but that's OK. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he helped me. His wife had had it being in Pennsylvania. You know, I think Pennsylvania is number one state for Lyme. Minnesota's number five. Wisconsin's number four. And so he helped me in 2013 realize the standard testing is has a lot of holes in it, a lot of things that get missed. My wife was one of those people. And it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about testing, because I really spent three years uh, doing a lot of the wrong things because I was just off target for my wife. Not bad things, but things that didn't help her. And anytime somebody brought up, is it Lyme disease? My answer was, no, I already tested that and ruled that out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually really think running a bad test can be actually more misleading to people than running no test. Because for years and years, I kind of dismissed Lyme as a possibility because I had, you know, ran that standard test and just didn't know that there's so many false, false negatives. At that time, did it take some time to run testing for toxins, mold, dual testing, or did you kind of do all that at once when it was kind of like, well, let's just tackle all of these things that could be contributing? Yeah, so I have a little bit unique perspective, like a love-hate relationship with gut and, and food stuff. So my wife and I started the way so many functional medicine people do, which is, you know, gut cleansing and changing people's diets and getting off standard American diet, getting on more of a holistic whole food, paleo diets, these kind of things, anti-inflammatory diets. But it's very frustrating because we put a lot of work into food. And at the end of the day, my wife was still so, so sick. Mm. And, you know, I was at a, um, but before I poo, poo that too much, I got a lot of people better in my practice by fixing their diet and fixing their gut. So 
I understand why so many doctors, you get a lot of bang for your buck by helping people's guts, helping people's food, helping adrenals and things like this. It's just so much help you can bring people. But I, I didn't help my wife at all. We'd ran hormone panels, we'd ran adrenal panels, and she was still extremely stuck, you know, kind of that way. And so this is also where I was at a conference and, you know, have you ever heard doctors say like, you know, 70% of the immune system's in the gut or 80% mm -hmm. of the immune mm -hmm. system's in the gut. So if you fix, and the, and the speaker said this, he said, so 70% of your immune system's in the gut. So if we fix the gut, we fix everything. And I remember pausing being like, I missed the math here. Like, how did we go from 70% to everything. To 100, yeah. To 100, yeah. and I was like, well, what kind of stuff creates health problems that's not necessarily centered in the gut? Not that it doesn't affect your gut. And that's where I got into things like, oh, well, metals, toxins, molds, Lyme and tick-borne illnesses are really in your blood, not really necessarily in your gut. And that that's kind of when my world kind of opened a little bit to understanding, oh, I, there's still a ton of value in helping people with food and helping with the gut. But there is certainly a list of things that make people sick that is that is beyond that, that, it, that is mm -hmm. very applicable to certain people, including, you know, my wife. And for those of us that might not be super familiar with Lyme disease and how it's contracted, because I know there's a lot coming out about how you actually can get Lyme disease and how you can't get Lyme disease. And we all think we had to have that bullseye rash with a tick bite, and that's just not really the case anymore. But can you kind of explain what it is and why it's often referred to as the great imitator? Oh, yes. So Lyme disease in general is coming from ticks. We've never really looked to see if you could get it from spiders or, or other things. But in general, we'll just say we're going to get it from tick bites. But we used to think it had to come from adults. And we've now proven that that's not true. You can get it from the nymphs and from some of the larval stages. And if you don't get bit from an adult tick, there's a decent chance you never find it. In fact, about half the people in my office will tell me I pulled the tick off on this day, I found it. And half the people are like, I have no memory of the mm -hmm. specific mm -hmm. tick. And the most famous symptom it causes is a bullseye rash. And what we've basically found is if you got the rash, usually medicine right now does a decent job of finding that it's Lyme. And unfortunately, if you're one of the, we'll say 50%, I think stats vary from about 30 to 70% of people do not get that classic rash. And if you don't get that rash, it's really uh, much more of a crapshoot for if we can diagnose it and figure out that it really is Lyme disease. And you talked about it being the great imitator. And this was another reason why we started to get into, I have to have accurate testing because it causes, I think it was just a study that came out in 2022 out of Belgium, and they're tracking 12 major symptoms for chronic Lyme. Fatigue, five different kinds of pain, joint pain, muscle pain, neck pain, headaches, but and joint swelling. So a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue. And then you're also looking at neurological symptoms. Now we've known about the pain and the neurological, we've known about the pain and the fatigue since the 80s when we discovered Lyme. And it's only since Columbia really came on board, maybe about eight years ago, they've really been pressing that Lyme can present mm -hmm. mainly as a neurological disease in many people. And that's a lot of thanks to Columbia for kind of documenting. But it's, but it's a big process. I may have 218 different nerve symptoms that Lyme can cause, something crazy wow. like that. And it's just because if you hit different nerves, you get different symptoms. And that makes it look really hard for doctors to diagnose. So a lot of doctors, because of the pain, you get to rheumatology, or you get to pain clinics. And then because of the neuro neurological symptoms, you get to eye doctors, you get to neurologists. Uh, they think it's MS. They think it's rheumatoid arthritis. Gosh. But what's hard is these doctors, when you start running tests, it doesn't quite fit. So the doctors start to get a little confused and you kind of start ping ponging um, through the system. I think there was an article released in January this last year that said the average Lyme person, by the time they're being diagnosed with chronic Lyme, has seen seven to 10 doctors. 
It's wild. It's just the merry-go-round that we refer to so often in functional medicine because the conventional system is siloed. Extremely siloed. Right. And and what's really wild is chronic Lyme. We've, we've recognized acute Lyme since the 80s. Chronic Lyme for 30 years was said, no, it's not real. No, it's not real. No, it's not real. No, it's not real. And then, boom, April 2022, the CDC said, oh, oh, it is. Oh, it is. Yes, finally. And that's exciting. I remember like I was actually sitting next to one of my friends at a conference who's he's in his late 60s and he's been doing this work longer. And and he literally hit me on the back and was like, well, that took my whole career. You take it from here. <laughs> I was like, so we do have some pros some progress. The NIH for the first time funded research on chronic Lyme in July of 2023. So we're getting funding to MIT, funding to John Hopkins, funding to Tufts, which is really exciting. I remember like when my wife got Lyme disease in 2013, I still felt like I was in like this secret society. Like you go to Lyme seminars that all felt very like, oh, I know something hush, nobody hush. knows. And now the conferences are 10 times as big. And I remember like when John Hopkins showed up at the conference and like when Columbia showed up and when Harvard showed up. And like, as you're starting to go and you're like, oh, like credibility and, and you know, some of these things, it's really nice to see research coming out. Obviously we still need so much more mm -hmm. um, because although they've recognized Lyme, another thing is most people who are chronically sick actually have co-infections which are other things ticks carry. I tell people Lyme disease is like Jennifer Aniston from Friends. She's just the most famous person from Friends. There were a lot of other people in Friends, but <laughs> Lyme is like Jennifer Aniston. So these right. co-infections are really her. important. They're really yeah. important. What about, Dr. Warren, this larger conversation of not just chronic Lyme, especially if it's never been treated, but sequelae and immune system dysfunction secondary to Lyme? How do we differentiate between the two? Of course, two, both of these things can be occurring at once also. Yeah, this is where I think, you know, the, the we kind of get into perspectives on improving and how you help people. And John Hopkins draws a three, kind of a threefold. So, you know, the three overlapping circles that all overlap in the middle. Right. And I tell people in order to really help people who are suffering from this, we're going to do some strategies that kind of attack and kill the bugs directly. And I think that's the part that makes sense to people. Oh, it's a bacteria. We should kill the bacteria with an antibiotic or, or something that kills the bacteria. Of course. But a huge part of this problem in any chronic illness is your immune system is technically fighting this thing. And it's losing. Hmm. And that's a huge problem. And I remember Jacob Leone, who's on the John Hopkins research team, I was having a conversation with him. And he said, you know, on, on when we tell people the number one priority we have for anyone suffering from Lyme is to restore proper immune system function. And the number two goal is to kill it. He goes, and he always, and he always adds in this clip, he goes, and I didn't mess up the order. So that's a really important part. Now, John Hopkins adds a third of you have to repair the parts of your body that are being damaged. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're attacking the bug, you're really, really addressing that immune system dysfunction. And then you're trying to repair the parts of your body that are being hurt. That that's, that's really the threefold approach we want to really be successful against something like, like a chronic infection or chronic Lyme. I just have to say, it's kind of amazing that this stepwise approach is being put out. You said Johns Hopkins is promoting this kind of multi-step approach in this larger conversation of now we are recognizing chronic Lyme in a conventional setting. And that's not how things are done generally in allopathic medicine. And so it's almost like functional medicine is is pushing its way through. And it's kind of, it's awesome when you think about it that way. We can't deny it anymore. We have to approach it holistically. Yeah, yeah I it's think really it's... cool that you've seen kind of the evolution of it as well. Like you said, like back in 2013, there were these like smaller conferences and now it's just become this whole, this whole different thing than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It's really nice to see something catching momentum and recognition. We just did a blog article on, I was doing an article late last year on why your rheumatologist misses you. Um, I had a particular patient who that just happened. So I was like, well, let's write an article on it. 
And then we came across an article published, I think, January of 2024, that was medical gaslighting in Lyme disease patients. Mm. And, you know, what's hard is I tell people I kind of fluctuate between crying of sadness for some of these people's stories and being really angry for what's happening. But when people get sick, what's hard is practically, even though the CDC recognized chronic Lyme two years ago, practically the system has been teaching against it for 30 years. And so you still have people who are really just having a rough time not being diagnosed correctly. Patients are often more likely to be told they're seeking drugs than they have Lyme. Mm -hmm. Patients are more likely to be told it's all in their head or it's coming from anxiety or it's coming from being old. I mean, I have people in their 30s and doctors are telling them, well, it's because you're old. Oh, God. Like 30 years old. (laughs) So I think. Uh, yeah, it's it's oh, man. So, you know, when I read that through, it was like, oh, my gosh, like these people who when you can't find the Lyme, they get accused of drug seeking. They get accused of being on their head. They get accused of being crazy. And that's literally what happened to me that made me so mad. My wife, we were at a doctor's appointment and the doctor pulled me aside and said, I think she just wants more attention. And I, I was like, honey, we need to leave. Like we need to like we're we're done. I'm going to punch him or we're going to walk out the door. And uh, that, but that's what's happening. It wasn't just my wife. It was as I, you know, kind of like when you open your eyes to this world, you realize this is happening at a crazy rate. I mean, the CDC says there's just under 500,000 cases of Lyme a year. And right on the NIH post where they're funding chronic Lyme, they say there's a 10 to 20% fail rate. Mm. That is 50 to 100,000 people every year, year after year after year that are falling through this hole. And it's a terrible hole. It's just, it's affecting people's lives and it's a terrible experience. And, you know, we can help, we can help that. For sure. Yeah. And I want to get into kind of your approach to testing and therapies. And before we do that, though, what's your opinion? Why do you think providers are slow or even wary to consider the possibility of chronic Lyme? Is it this new thing that they just don't know how to approach? So it's, or maybe they know the complexity of the management. They just say, I I don't want any part of that. This is malingering or at best they refer, right? (laughs) At at best they refer and you kind of ping pong through. You know, I don't know because I have found that I think it's more complicated I think my short answer is it's a little more complicated and doctors don't don't like that because the system doesn't allow for hard or changeable things. And I, I think this we kind of got into this just a little bit earlier, but, you know, vector borne illnesses are not the same. It's not like you just give penicillin and syphilis is gone the way many, many antibiotics have worked to to kind of simplify diseases. You know, these these tick borne illnesses, when you look at them genetically, they are more diverse because they are designed to get inside mammals and morph to their system. So they have to be able to get inside a deer, get inside a dog, get inside you, get inside a mouse, get inside a raccoon, get inside a squirrel, and then adapt to that mammal's immune system. And Stephen Buhner, who is an herbalist who wrote many books on Lyme, would talk about Lyme is genetically unique. And technically, the Lyme that's in you has genetically adapted to you, which makes it slightly different than the Lyme in anybody else. That's so crazy. Wow. And so I think the idea that you're gonna find this one pill, one solution for every person is just a misnomer. And I think on one hand that drives medicine, you know, major, mainstream medicine a little bit nuts. They really want that one pill, one cure. Really, they really like it. And then I think on the functional side, I think it's complicated and difficult enough to where a lot of functional medicine providers don't want to touch it. Because <laughs> I definitely have really good bunk med doctors who are intimidated a little bit by, by Lyme. And I'm not sure if that's just yeah. because sometimes if you do the wrong thing with Lyme, your hand gets slapped a little harder than other conditions. So mm-hmm. you can kind of have it blow up in your face where people have bad reactions to what you're doing. And if you don't know how to make sense of that, maybe that scares some doctors off just because it's a, it is, as I said, it's a little bit harder condition. Like my, my, my partner, I partner with another function man practitioner who does tons of really good gut cases and diet cases type stuff. And he very, very rarely, in fact, 
he does not fill out like disability forms. So he just doesn't deal with people that are that, that sick. That's the line. And I don't want to make it seem, yeah, all well, my Lyme people, probably about a fifth of them are disabled and supported by, mm-hmm. you know, something else. So when I started doing more Lyme, I got into just a little bit sicker people also than, than maybe I was doing previously, more men than I was doing previously. Oh, but my other practice was more women. And I think ticks uh, get, you know, men, they're outdoorsy. So I got more men. I have a lot of DNR workers, surprise, surprise, in Minnesota. You know, so you just get a little bit different pi- patient population and it just comes out a little bit different. Hmm. Yeah, Dr. Warren, I, w- I was going to ask earlier, you know, what is there anything that you know that puts someone at higher risk for contracting Lyme or is it kind of just, you know, we're seeing it more in men because they're more outdoorsy? Or, like, is there anything or a- any type of population that's more susceptible or is it like if you get bit and the tick has Lyme, you're going to get it? Well, so it's a great question. One of which is going to lead us into some of the other testing. But mm-hmm. so I, I, I think one, if you're just more outdoorsy and you're in areas where there are more ticks, you certainly have a little bit higher risk. Um, that can be man or woman. But if you like being outdoors and you're in the, if you're anywhere around the Great Lakes, certainly Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, these areas are big areas. But anywhere there's deer, there can be deer ticks. That's kind of the way you know, this works. So it's not confined to that area the way we maybe previously thought as exclusively, even though it's more prevalent, uh, more prevalent there. As to the question of why or how often it goes chronic. So if you give 100 people Lyme disease, we really think 80 people get better. 20 people go chronic. Mm -hmm. We'll use those kind of numbers. Now, I think there's two things going on. Of those 20 people that are chronic, 19 of them will have co-infections. So I think really what happens the vast majority of the time is if you just get one tick-borne illness, I really think your immune system beats it the vast majority of the time. Mm -hmm. And the people who are getting chronically sick, Merry Christmas, Santa brought you three different illnesses together. And it's kind of the combination of the two or three together Mm -hmm. that makes it so that your immune system just can't get on the right side of this thing. Dr. Richard Harwitz has two books on Lyme and he calls it MSIDS or multiple systemic infectious disease syndrome. Good job. Doctors, I'm always looking up that one. <laughs> yeah, I like, doctors just like lots of acronyms. But the idea is it's not one infection. You actually have multiple, and that's what creates, you know, the problem. And then lastly, I would add, I'm I'm big on the chemical world. I'm I'm convinced that, and this is I love the toxic chemical panel. I don't know you guys, but I love it, love it because I think people don't realize how many chemicals are in their bodies and in the environment post-World War II. And when I run these toxic chemical screens on people, people are shocked that they have, you know, these variety of chemicals. And people just go, what's that doing to me? And my answer is, well, it's not helping you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? good, good answer. Right on. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So let's talk about testing a little bit more in terms of Lyme, Dr. Warren, and co-infections particularly repeat testing. What's your approach to repeat testing? Oh, I'm a huge fan. And this is like where I I really think in my Lyme community in the 90s. So Lyme was discovered in the 80s. And then there's this all a lot of your founding Lyme associations and advocacy groups started in the 90s because the guidelines got published, I think, in 92 to 94. And so you have a lot of Lyme groups that really started in the 90s. Now, in the 90s, the testing's not good. And so you have a lot of this, like, just go based on symptoms and don't ever test. And I think in the 90s, that might have been the best approach, but I really don't believe it is now. And I really like very thorough testing. And I think right now, Vibrant has the best test available in the world for a couple of reasons. So they do multiple species of Lyme. And I'm convinced right now, if you're only doing Borrelia burgdorferi, you're just you're going to miss about a quarter of the people that you should be testing. Mm-hmm. So when I run what well, we find, it's about a quarter of the people that are, oh, you have Lyme. You don't have Borrelia burgdorferi. You have Borrelia spielmanni or Borrelia mayoni or Borrelia mm-hmm. whatever. And it's not as regional as we used to. You don't have to go to France to get Guarini. You don't have to go here to get this. Like it's it's not as isolated as we thought. 
Mm. And I will tell you, being in Minnesota, hard cases either go to the University of Minnesota or to the prestigious Mayo Clinic, which I'm about an hour, hour and a half from. When people have been to Mayo and they couldn't figure them out, and then they come and they have Borrelia mayoni, the one discovered at the Mayo Clinic in oh, 2013, gosh, they get very upset. Oh, no. I can right. see that. Lime, you really, if you're not running multiple species of Lyme at this point, you're just way behind. And then as far as co-infections go, this is also a little bit of passion of mine. So I think, you know, we tend to talk about the, the three Bs, Borrelia, which is Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella. And I think the Babesia and Bartonella testing is terrific. It's a big deal, but I'm going to skip over that because those get... Those kind of get talked about a lot. And what I'm very passionate about is the other co-infections, even when I go to Lyme conferences, do not get the attention that they really, really need. And this is another thing I think when I see Lyme doctors, they're running tests for the three Bs. They're running Borrelia, Babesia, and Bartonella. Mm -hmm. And they're missing anaplasma, which is the fourth most common and is a huge deal here in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And the other thing they're missing that I'll take the time to talk about today is the tick-borne encephalitis viruses, the flaviviruses, the Powassan viruses. So if I can take the anaplasma first. So you have to run a co-infection panel that's not just the three Bs. You, mm -hmm. just, you just need more because I'm telling you're missing. It makes a difference. And I'm so passionate about anaplasma because my wife had it and it made a huge difference in her case. And I think it make a huge difference in lots of other cases. So anaplasma is the fourth most common tick-borne illness. And it does a couple things that really you need to know as a doctor. Number one, because it goes in the neutrophils, it weakens the immune system. I tell my patients, it's like taking your police force, taking away their guns, handing them fun noodles and saying, go arrest people. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and so if you're trying to kill Lyme and I've just weakened your bacterial fighters, this is where we get into the immune dysfunction portion. Right. Well, you're going to be less successful trying to kill Lyme if the anaplasma is weakening the immune system that's supposed to kill the Lyme. Two, it can lower the platelets. And I think when we look at like PRP injections and all the wonderful growth, you know, healing factors that platelets have, if I start lowering platelets, guess what? You don't heal as fast. Mm. And the number one question I get, I don't, not sure about you, Dr. Amy, but is when will I feel better? Like all this theory is great, but mm -hmm. when will I actually feel better? Mm -hmm. And if you have anaplasma and it's lowering the platelets, the answer is longer mm -hmm. because it's, I have a picture of a turtle by anaplasma because it just slows it, it slows down your healing. Okay. And that's important to know because if I know it's going to be slower, I can beg for a little more patience. But if not, then you're going to get really frustrated and go, oh, it's not working. And yeah, I think it's kind of I like think, understanding. Like if the patient understands what's going on, they're going to have a little bit more patience. I could see that. Exactly. And I think that gives you a little bit with anaplasma. But then the other thing anaplasma does is it starts to hurt the liver. Mm. And so anaplasma makes the Lyme disease protected. But then if you combo toxins like chemical toxins or pesticides or herbicides or plastics or parabens, so I throw poison on you or mold, right? I throw poison on your system and then I start breaking the liver so it can't handle those poisons as well. It is a recipe for a very, very hard patient and a lot of symptoms and a lot of reactivity to meds, a lot of reactivity to supplements. And so these people become very reactive and very difficult, kind of tied up in a knot and you got to get them undone. And I think anaplasma does that if you start adding it's not the anaplasma by itself, right? It's the anaplasma plus the lime or the anaplasma plus the toxins that you're going, oh boy, this is going to be a knot with a couple strings in it that I've got to start trying to pull and unravel here. Mm. So I'm very passionate about anaplasma. It's one of those like, am I going to spend the next 20 years of my life kind of trying to help bring more awareness to some of these co-infections, anaplasma in particular, that I think even though the Lyme community is growing so much, I think there's a huge problem with anaplasma that does not get uh, talked about enough.
Yes, yes, I agree. And thank you so much for bringing that up because we really haven't dived into co-infections uh, to that level and particularly featuring anaplasma. So that's hugely I'm, helpful. I'm, and I want to unravel management in terms of anaplasma amongst the other co-infections in line. But before we do that, I'm curious, Dr. Warren, what are you looking for in repeat testing in terms of, are you looking for a modest decrease in IgGs paired with clinical yeah. improvement? Is there a strategy? I've heard a couple different opinions here. So I'm mm -hmm. curious what you're looking for in repeat testing. Yeah, the repeat testing. Thanks again. I know you asked that once and That's I That's okay. Went off. Um, I'm really curious. So I'm circling back. So <laughs> I tell people your your immune system, theoretically, when you get an infection, the immunoglobulins rise up. M's first, then G's. Yeah. But really in the long once it's long term, it can look it can look different. But theoretically, the immune system rises up to fight something. It should win and then it should calm down. Mm. And it doesn't calm down all the way to zero. You can keep a long-term memory run, but that's what I'm basically looking for on retesting. So uh, just as a basic timeline, I, I like to retest about every six months. And I like this because, and what I'm looking for is if, the, if it's going up, that's okay. It means your immune system is rising up to fight the enemy. That's good. That's what we want. Eventually, I want it to calm down. But it's okay if it's going up. It's telling me, look, it's working. Your immune system is doing this. We're going to try to help your body do what it's trying to do. But eventually, I want to see your body feel like it's winning and calming down to a low baseline. And we find if you give people some... My mentor said people want measurable progress in a reasonable amount of time. Yes. Brilliant. And I found what I love about the Vibrant test is it gives you numbers and you can kind of track what's going on. And so what we find so often is let's say you have two or three things. When you retest, you find, oh my gosh, one or two of them are better. Yay. And guess what? One of them is not better or maybe even looks higher. And we go, that's okay. I'm going to make adjustments to my protocol to try to help your body do what I can see it's trying to do. So did I, did I answer your question there? Yes. I ultimately want it to Me calm too. down, but I'm okay in the short term if it comes up. I take that as a sign that, well, that's what your immune system is prioritizing at right. the moment. It's a process and there's there's nuance to it. So thank you for walking us through that because you did nail some specifics there that you're looking for in terms of timing. And that and the symptoms are important. I do I do tell people we want to take the data from the tests and the data that the patient tells us about their life, their activities, daily living, their symptoms. You want to put it all together to try to make your best choices. Um, I always get asked, are you a lab guy or a symptom guy? And I'm like, can we do both? Oh, like, can we, we have not? to do both. Why are we so <laughs> black and white? Come on. Right. I know. And Dr. Ward, I know your site mentions that you like to run micronutrient panels as well. And I, I can imagine when the immune system is being challenged, you know, like with these co-infections, do you see patterns in micronutrient deficiencies? Like is the body eating up more minerals than, than normal or what are you seeing? Yeah, this has been really eye-opening. So the core, and this was, this was a conversation I had, gosh, it's got to be it's pre-COVID, so this is maybe 20, is this 2020, right before I'm at, or maybe the end of 2019. Jacob Leone, as I, said, as I mentioned before, I had a conversation with him about getting the immune system functional again in these chronically sick people. And, you know, we can do generic things. Like, you can give everyone zinc. I love zinc. Zinc's fabulous. You know, and and you could give and, Let's just throw that And up. magnesium. Yeah. And, yeah. We could all, but I, all use some zinc and magnesium. We could all use some zinc. And, and I... Salt. And I followed Dr. You know Richard Harowitz before, who once again has been a wonderful you know mentor and person to listen from. But I, I ran into problems where like these protocols can get really big, like really fast. You know, like Dr. Harowitz protocols can be 20, 30 different supplements at the same time, and you're just kind of adding and adding and adding. And I needed a way to try to prioritize because. I had a patient also at the time who was who was very low in vitamin A. Um, and we found out later they had a genetic problem with vitamin A where they couldn't get it from vegetables. They could only get it from animal 
products. Mm. Well, the animal sources of vitamin A are liver and eyeballs, which m most cultures do not eat now, okay? I don't know last time you had eyeballs, but I haven't had them in a long time. And so we got them this vitamin A from an animal source and it like changed their whole world. They were basically wow. better. It was, a, it was one of those miracle cases that I remember. Well, what did she do? She went around telling everyone they needed vitamin A. And I was like, well, okay, it's great, but they don't need vitamin A the way you needed vitamin A. And so it's not going to do for them the same thing it just did for, for you. And that's where we started to become a, a stalwart champion of, I need a test that looks at vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, because glutathione's great and vitamin A is great and vitamin B is great and vitamin C is great. And and I needed a way to try to go, but what do you individually need so I know which ones are worth getting? And this also was, there's two reasons why I'm pretty, I'm pretty stalwart for this. So one, I think having just the raw materials helps your immune system function, which means if, we're, if the ultimate goal is we gotta kill the Lyme, <clears throat> it's gonna help us be more successful because your immune system has the raw materials to function. But, you don't actually feel better when you kill the Lyme. I tell people like your immune system and Lyme are fighting a war. And if you think about like Europe after World War II, okay, the war ends, boom, Hitler surrenders. Okay, but Europe has been bombed to kingdom come. Like, it's not like it just worked the next day. Mm -hmm. And this is the way people's bodies are. It's like, okay, if you just got rid of it, you still have to rebuild some bridges and rebuild some roads and rebuild all the broken things. Right. And doing the nutrients not only helped me be more successful at killing the bug or having your immune system kill the bug, it helps you like start repairing things, which shortens that amount of time till the patient tells you, oh, I feel better. And I had a patient with this with vitamin B12 because I used to run the, I used to wait to run the micronutrient test till I was done with the line. And now I no longer wait. We just run it right away. Because I had a patient who was with me for a year and they were testing negative at a year for the Lyme. All the markers had come down beautifully. And they said, gosh, I'm still so tired. I have no energy. Hmm. And I still ache and I still... And this is where we get to doctors who are going, well, then you still have Lyme. You still have the pain. You still have the fatigue. It must not be gone. We're just going to, we're just going to kill, 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 uh. kill, kill. And we ran the micronutrient test and they were just had no B12. And they had no manganese and they had no magnesium. And I'm like, guys, okay, if you have no B12 and no magnesium, you won't have energy. I don't care if you have Lyme or don't have Lyme. <laughs> And this, and I gave her the B12 and the magnesium and she was better in like two months. And I got to this, you would have been better sooner had mm. I been helping the B12 and the magnesium sooner. Mm. So me delaying the micronutrient test delayed her and gave her a chance to, to fail. And I like, I didn't need that chance. I didn't need that chance. So I'm really a stalwart. That's, I think besides the Lyme testing, it's the second test that I run on like everybody who walks in my door who were suspicious of Lyme. And then we run the other testing, you know, like the, the mold stuff. If we're worried about water damage building or you got sick within, you know, six months of moving or things like that, or we run heavy metals or pesticides and chemicals if you're exposed or if you live out in farm country or you. So these other things I run, do you, do you have a history? Do you have symptoms? Do you have things? But on almost everybody, I run the tick test because people are coming to me for ticks and I run the nutrient test on absolutely everyone. And then the other tests I'm doing based on your, your risk factors and your exposure and things. I had one more with an antimony thing. So was it antimony or uranium? I guess I forget the metal. But the person was sick from Lyme and had been seeing another Lyme doctor. Hmm. And I ran the vibrant Lyme test and it was totally negative. And I was like, wow, I do not see that very much mm -hmm. in people who and have a history really of Lyme. Frustrating for the patient too, you know, you, they you have all these symptoms, they run this, you know, extravagant test and it just comes back with nothing. Comes back nothing. And I said, has anybody run anything else on you? And she let me run a toxic panel screen on her. 
and I actually think it was at uranium was like 109, one of the metals, I forget which one, 193 times the normal. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. And we found out later they had a well, they were lived in, in the country and they had to dig the well 500 some feet deep, which is very deep for a well. Mm -hmm. And they actually, the well was contaminated with this metal. Ugh. And this is what's really hard is I firmly believe she had Lyme disease and she'd been working with a competent practitioner for like three years on the Lyme before she came to see me for another opinion. And the doctor was just like, we don't need to retest. And you still have symptoms, so you still have Lyme. And I was like, I, I need some periodic, ob I tell people I need periodic objective evidence that lets me know I'm still on the right road going the right direction. Right. Mm -hmm. And because it's not only Lyme, it, there's other things in the world. You know, even though I live in tick country and ticks are a huge deal, you know, you can still have metals and molds. And of course. And as you said prior, it's a cumulative effect so often yeah. that makes us so sick. You have or to be conscious of that. Absolutely. I am curious also when you are starting to treat patients for Lyme, what are some of those antimicrobials that you use in that kind of kill phase when you're helping the immune system? Sure, sure. So the short answer on this is there's three papers John Hopkins has published with like 80 some different herbs against Lyme. They have one uh, for Bartonella and one for Babesia. But the ones that they found in 2017, they found oregano, Clove and cinnamon are absolutely terrific against Lyme in the chronic phase. We want to mm. stress here, Lyme has this active phase where the antibiotics work pretty well. And then they have a biofilm phase and a stationary phase where the antibiotics really do not are not as effective. It, they're much more resistant to those therapies. And I think this is where the herbal world actually hits the bugs in those phases more efficiently with fewer side effects. So oregano, clove, and cinnamon were in that first study. 2018 study, we really just used garlic from the 2018 study. And then the 2020 study found herbs such as cryptolepis, Japanese knot, I think it's wormwood, cat's claw, Chinese skullcap. I love Chinese skullcap. And I think it's the only one I don't use from the 2020 study is cystis, but there were like six or seven herbs. So I tell people there's about 10 different herbs that the John Hopkins team has uh, studied that it really work well against Lyme. It doesn't mean that they're the only herbs, but they've studied like 80, 83, 87 herbs, and they have kind of their top, top 10. Now I do want to stress for doctors listening. I tried like, let's just give all 10 at once. Cause that'll be faster. Mm -hmm. Like, no, don't do that. Okay. Just don't, <laughs> it's going to be faster. Yeah. Okay. And so I'll tell you two to three killers at a time is probably enough. And you need to balance that with immune balancing stuff and some detox stuff. And if you balance it correctly, you have minor Herx effects or die off effects, but it's very manageable. If you balance it incorrectly, it feels like a truck ran over your patient and they'll quit on you. So you need to be balancing that immune and detox stuff with the kill kind of stuff as you go through. Uh, one thing I'll also note is I've asked every lecturer at like ILADS conferences. Every year I go, I ask all the lecturers, how long does it take Lyme people to get better? Yes, please. I get the, sa tell. I get the same, same answer. I get the same answer. It depends. <laughs> Which is, the and I go, you okay. don't want. It depends. That's the answer you don't <laughs> yeah. want. And then if you press them, if you press them, I will tell you, almost all the doctors will give you some kind of like, eh, give me six to 24 months. Wow. Okay. Six to 24 a, months. That's a big range. Process. It's a big yeah. range, but you'll start to go, okay, people will say one to two years, six to 18 months, six to 20. So it's, I go, you talk to all the best Lyme disease people in the year and you go, oh, this is not a fast, you know, fast thing. And I'll, they all have one percenters. You know, I tell people I have three people a year who come back for the first follow-up appointment in six weeks and they're 90 to 95% better. Wow. Um, but everyone I know has some of those people who just, you know, kind of get better. The vast majority of people, this is a, a slow, um, we tell people the tortoise wins the race. Marathon, not a sprint. 
marathon, not a sprint. And right. so just keep that in mind when you're doing Lyme is, you know, we're really hoping between six and 12 months, you have measurable progress by six months, even more measurable progress by 12 months and really getting some symptoms improved by 12 months. I always want it faster than that. We always want it as fast as possible, but this is one where we're going, depending on how complicated you are, you know, it can take a little while to feel better. Dr. Harwitz has a great analogy. He goes, if you walk in the office and you have three nails in your foot oh gosh. and I pull a nail out, are you better? And we're going to pause there and give you a survey. Can you fill out the survey? <laughs> Do you feel 33% better with? Yeah. And he goes, and then even then, like, let's pull all three nails up. Boom, boom, boom. And then quick, we hand you a survey. Do you feel better? And you're like, hang on. My, I still have holes in my foot. Like, like, give me just a little bit of time to, like, let the foot heal, and then I will give you a rave review, doctor. And or so, the patient wants all 10 at once because they think the, it's going to be faster. Yeah, right? they think That's kind of a brutal and graphic yet very effective analogy and visual. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of a condition I tell people, you, usually it's going to take some time to just start, you know, but it should be getting more simple. And that's why I love the testing and the retesting. I'm very much convinced that the huge mistake so many doctors make is they don't retest enough. Because if you come up and you have a metal and you have mold and you have three tick-borne illnesses and you have four nutrient problems, you should be able to retest six months, nine months, 12 months down the road, and you should be getting more simple. You should go, oh, look, now you only have three things instead of seven. Yeah. You're getting closer. And that what's really interesting is that's actually really encouraging to the patients. And they'll stick with you longer to get to that success with the retesting and the measurables that I think without the retesting, they can't hang on that long. They can't stay with you mm -hmm. that long. So you need some periodic testing, both for you to know how to make adjustments and for them just to stick with you. Absolutely. And for any patients that are listening in, what advice can you provide to allow patients to advocate for themselves if they suspect that they have Lyme disease, but they're not getting the answers or the help that they need? Ooh. You know, for now, you really have to find a functional medicine provider who does have some Lyme experience. And as we said, one of your easiest things is just what kind of Lyme testing are you running? Are you running stuff with multiple species of Borrelia? Are you running stuff with the co-infections? Is it a very thorough co-infection panel? I mean, we didn't even talk about it, but I think one of the things Vibrant has beat on some of its competition is the Powassan virus is a huge deal. I find it in 10% of cases. Maine has done a study where they did 1,700 ticks. They find it in 6 to 7% of ticks. Wisconsin finds it in 10% of ticks. So mm -hmm. the idea that we've only ever documented like 366 cases in 20 years, yeah. I literally think we're missing this by the tens of thousands. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that that's a big deal. So you really, I think when you're looking for a doctor, you're looking for, do you do, you know, accurate thorough testing? Because this is not just Lyme. It's really Lyme plus all these you know, co-infections. And I think that's a huge thing to look for if you're a patient is do you do kind of accurate, accurate assessment? And then they just need to do a strategy that gels with you. You know, there's lots of different people out there. Some people do antibiotics, some people do all natural, some people do, excuse me, there's some, there's some other cool therapies out there. So I tell people, you can kind of do any therapy as long as you're testing and measuring and tracking. If it works and gets you better, it works. But you should be able to test, do something that's plausible that your body can do, that's hopefully safe. And you should be able to sooner or later retest and go, did it work? Mm -hmm. And if it worked, great. If it didn't work, we tell people grab a new baseball bat and swing again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm really big on, you know, what should work is different than what does work. And so that's also why it's, again, it's, you know, I would ask doctors, do you test? Is it a good test? And do you retest? Because so many of my doctors, they don't, it's like, I've, there's, a, there's an Austin Powers movie where he's captured, you know, Dr. Evil's ca captured Austin Powers and he like traps him and he's going to get eaten by sharks or something. <laughs> 
And he's like, we're just going to walk away and assume it all went to plan. Like, what's wrong with this? And I feel like that's what so many doctors do. Like, we do it and we just, okay, here's the plan. Then we just walk away like, "Eh, that'll all work. Right. And retesting is so important. Mm, Yeah. And you really um, illustrated that point earlier, Dr. Warren, when you said that my Lyme is unique compared to someone else's Lyme. And that's so wild, but it's really helpful to understand just how truly individualized these plans need to be. And troubleshooting is okay. So I heard that come through too. Yeah, troubleshooting really is to be expected. You mm. know, I tell people right now with, with all the things we do, I can avoid about four out of five blowups that I had 10 years ago. But still, there is a certain point of we need to try this. And based upon what you react well or good good or bad to that tells me things and it may take me a little bit of time to learn what to do with you individually there's the concepts are the same everyone needs some killers everyone needs some immune balancing everyone needs these concepts but the individual details and that may be the other thing you're looking for in a doctor is i i talk about these concepts but if you were to follow me around the individual application can be very custom on dosing, on orders. And, you know, you should have a different protocol for Lyme and Babesia than you have for Lyme and Bartonella or Lyme and Powassan or Lyme and Anaplasm. Mm. And so there's also this, like, not everyone who walks in has the exact combination of things. And putting together those things for your person, you know, is really the key is to, do you want mass individualization is what you... <laughs> It's truly an art and you're an artist and obviously, you know, an art and a science artist, artist and a scientist. It's, it's a lot to take in. I I value that. I have to ask, uh, amongst this conversation, Dr. Warren, how do you maintain your own health and wellness while managing such a demanding practice and demanding conditions such as tick-borne illness? (laughs) Well, one is I always recommend run the tests on yourself. Okay. So, uh, you know, it is always nice to practice what you preach and, and make sure you're doing the things for yourself that you always recommend your patients do. So I uh, realized when I got to working that I now have a sitting job. Like I ran cross country in college and was very active. And so I had all these lazy hobbies. And I've realized now that I have to have hobbies, like when we go golfing, we're going to walk and we're going (laughs) to mountain bike. And, you know, I love the outdoors. I have kids. So, you know, playing catch with the lacrosse and you know, soccer and, and all these things keeps me pretty busy. But, you know, really for me, you know, I know it's about making sure you're getting the good food, right? Getting to bed on time and then getting outside and being active is just so important. I, I cannot stress how bad sitting is for you mm-hmm. and we do so much of it. And so, you know, that's that's what I always tell my Lyme disease people. I go, look, at the end of this, it's your lifestyle that keeps you healthy. It's really just my job to get rid of things so that that your body and your health is a reflection of your healthy habits. Mm. What's frustrating about Lyme is you can have all the healthy habits in the world and you're still very sick. But eventually we need you to eat good food that's good for you, that's clean and get some exercise, spend some time with people you love. You know, we need all those healthy habits to be the long term, uh, you know, solutions. I I like that you mentioned that because it's like we can remove all of the blockers that are keeping you from feeling good that are, you know, co-infections or toxins and metals and, uh, you know, all these things. But at the end of the day, after those things are removed, you want to feel amazing. You still have to eat well, sleep well, live well, lower your stress. Like you can't be stressed out all the time and, you know, expect expect to feel good at the end of the day, you know, lime, lime or not. But Yeah. And those are fun things to get to. You know, that's the best part about practice is seeing people better. And when they're sending you messages or pictures of the things they're doing, I used to tell people you could do everything in life except climb Mount Everest. And then we had somebody go to Mount Everest. So (laughs) I love that. It's really fun when you have old patients pop in and they're like, I'm fishing or or they forget their appointment. They answer their phone from like, I'm on a mountain. Yeah. Like, oh, you're just so healthy now. You're living your life again and you know for, for a lot of people that's that's the best part of of you know being a doctor is is as people start to re-engage in their life and do you know and to be able to do the things in life that god calls you to do we just want to see you healthy enough to go live your life 
that's what we want. And that's exciting when that starts to happen. That's amazing. I love that, Dr. Warren. We're ending this episode on such a positive and light note. If anyone tuning in today, any of our listeners want to connect with you or potentially be a future patient, where can our listeners find you? Sure. So our clinic is Restorative Health Solutions. So we have restorativehealthsolutions.com. I also own the domain LimeDR.com. So we just have a lot of information on both those websites on uh, Lyme disease and the clinic in general, although my my career kind of my clinic has been taken over by Lyme and tick-borne uh, uh, people. So there's certainly a great emphasis on Lyme and tick-borne illness on, on those sites. Awesome. Well, we'll be sure to link the, the couple of websites that you gave us down in the show notes so that everyone tuning in can, you know, find easy access to connect with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Warren. This episode was incredible. We haven't really had someone go so deep on Lyme disease and have so much experience with Lyme and co-infections before. So again, just super grateful for everything you brought to the podcast today and for everyone tuning in. Thanks so much and wishing us all vibrant health and wellness. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.